Well, hello, good evening. Um, we're so happy you're here to join us for our webinar this evening, uh, Safe and Smart Exercises for Diabetes. Um, should you have any technical difficulties during the broadcast, um, there is a number at the bottom of the screen to call um, Log Me In Support at 800-263-6317. Our format includes a short presentation followed by an interactive discussion. To type in a question, use the questions section of the webinar toolbar. At the end, you'll have a chance to ask questions. So we look forward to an interactive webinar. We know that the information you're about to hear may motivate you to make lifestyle changes. So please consult your physician before making any changes to your current routine. The Cecilia Health Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist will provide strategies to help you manage your diabetes. This online Q&A session is intended to, ge to give general advice. This information is not a substitute for personal medical advice and involves the professional opinion of the Cecilia Health Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist. Our webinar leader this evening is Laura Ashley Johnson. Laura Ashley has been a practicing registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist for 10 years. She's from Irvine, Kentucky, but now lives in Houston, Texas. Laura has a passion for nutrition and enjoys cooking for her family. Some of her other hobbies are watching Kentucky basketball, traveling with her family, and spending time with her Norfolk Terrier named Butter. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Laura. We're very happy um, that you're here to lead us, um, and you may take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Katie, and thanks everyone for joining tonight. This is one of my favorite webinars we do over the course of the year, and um, we get lots of feedback, too, that sometimes you know, after this call, if you can take away a couple goals and, and, and motivational aspects to just get yourself started, that's what we hope for for you. So um, like she said, this is interactive. I've got my little box over here open in case there's a question that comes in. Um, there, We're going to cover quite a bit. Um, and if I know I'm going to cover it, I might wait till we get to that point as well. But I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys have to ask. So here's the agenda, what we're going to cover for tonight. We're going to talk about the benefits of physical activity and the research that supports the claims that physical activity will help. You know, how much exercise is enough? I get that question a lot from patients. How much should I really be doing? How to manage blood glucose and how to adjust insulin. This is important as you are managing your blood sugars. And then, of course, our questions, answers, and sharing. So first, barriers to activity. Whew. You know, there are many challenges, you know, reasons, excuses, kind of whatever you want to call it, that are expressed kind of as roadblocks to physical activity. You know, maybe you don't enjoy it. Maybe you don't have time. You're tired of the starting and the quitting cycle. Maybe you can't afford a gym membership or um, maybe you're not seeing the changes that you want to see in your body. You know, childcare issues, non time is the big thing I really hear a lot. Too stressed, too tired, too sore. Oh gosh, they, we could really make a long list of reasons why we have got barriers to activity. But some of these are harder than others to fix and overcome. We, we get that, we understand that too. But we wanna help get that physical activity incorporated. So under these circumstances, you can, you can if you truly desire to get exercise in, you can do it. So let's talk about the benefits. So sometimes even when you feel yourself going against the fact, you know, getting your exercise started, just stop and think about all of the wonderful things that can happen as a result of getting physical activity into your routine. It helps with mental, emotional, and physical health. It reduces the risk of developing or die, dying from heart disease or a stroke. Um, it helps reduce blood pressure and risk of developing hypertension. It increases that healthy cholesterol. If For those of you who like to remember the difference between those cholesterols too, the healthy one is the H and we want it high. That's why you can remember that one. And it also can help decrease the triglycerides and that bad cholesterol. The bad is the LDL and we want that low LDL. 
It can increase metabolism, which can help with weight loss too. Many people are trying to lose weight, especially after last year. It was quite a tough year. I know a lot of people have some weight loss goals for 2021. But regular physical activity can also strengthen bones and muscles and slow down the loss of bone density. Um, it can help you rest and sleep better at night, more peaceful sleep, decrease stress, anxiety. You know, it can also help regulate and improve your blood sugar levels, which we're really, really helping you take a look at. So for those of you watching this on your webinar right now, you're seeing a little cartoon. It shows a bloodstream and the cell. So physical activity has a wonderful effect on insulin sensitivity. It helps insulin work better. So just kind of envision sugar floating in your blood. It's in there floating around and it wants to have insulin unlock the cells so that it can get out of the blood and go into your cells. That's what gives you energy. When you're using your muscles more, when you're doing physical activity, they need more sugar too. So you have this effect of sugar coming out of the blood into the cells and muscles more because they need more. So you're burning more. So this is really a key element in helping improve your diabetes management with exercise. So this is a huge study that was done. It's called the DPP or the Diabetes Prevention Program. It was a major clinical trial that was aimed at figuring out whether diet and exercise or oral diabetes drug specifically metformin could prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in people with prediabetes. So this was a very, very big study that launched a lot of the um, practices that we, we abide by with our uh, diabetes management programs. So in 2001, there were 27 clinical centers around the country that were split into random groups. There was the lifestyle group that received intense you know, diet training, exercise, and behavior modification. They were eating less fat, less calories, and exercising 150 minutes a week. A 5 to 7% weight loss was recommended as well. They met with researchers 16 times in 24 weeks, and then they met with them in two months, um, and then two months with an at least one phone call between their visits. So they had a lot of coaching along the process as well. The second group took 850 milligrams of metformin twice a day. The third group had placebo pills. The second and third group also got info on diet and exercise, but no intensive counseling efforts. So that first group, they got a ton. The other two did not. In total, there were 3,234 participants that were overweight and insulin glucose intolerant. So let's take a look at what happened as a result. So here we go. Take a look at this chart. I'll give you a moment to look at it. So for those who don't look at it too, we have our three different groups, our lifestyle group, our medication group, and our placebo group. They're all listed there. So versus the placebo, the incidence of diabetes with the lifestyle group showed a 58% reduction and 31% less with metformin group of diabetes, incidence of diabetes. So comparing the lifestyle to metformin showed 39% reduction with lifestyle. So it was clinically proven with this study, and it was paramount in showing how effective lifestyle changes really, really are with diabetes management and prevention of diabetes. We got our, all right. So let's look here. So studies conducted over the past 15 years have noted that complications frequently found in obese patients appear to be associated with that location of excess fat rather than the excess weight, specifically this belly area, the abdominal area. So the patient with abdominal obesity and metabolic syndrome is at a higher risk for coronary artery disease, type two diabetes and related mortality. So when we see a patient that has that extra layer of, of belly fat, we don't think you know, that they can't make changes to address that because they really can. They can turn things around. But we see that as a trigger of we want to try to really set some great lifestyle changes so that we can start moving this belly fat 
out of the way. So a simple and practical screening tool that we use, and I use when I used to work in my office with patients too, is a measurement at the waist with a tape measure. And you could do this at home as well. Um, you can use just a pull around tape measure. You wanna try to make sure you do it at the same area though. A lot of times with patients, um, especially my, my ladies, uh, they tell me a lot that, you know, I get really discouraged when I don't see the pounds go down when I'm trying to lose weight. So I tell them, make sure we're taking some measurements as well, especially your, your belly area, that abdominal fat, because you may not have lost pounds, but you may have actually lost some inches. So it can be one of those tools that can help for motivation and to just, in, you know, to really reaffirm that the efforts you're making are really paying off. So along with abdominal fat, there are many other cardiovascular risk factors. So family history, if you've had blood relatives that have had coronary artery disease before the age of 60, you know, you can't control heredity, but you can help reduce through other risk factors. So smoking, you know, nicotine narrows the blood vessels. Um, it causes an increase in blood pressure and heart rate. Carbon monoxide competes with the oxygen and the red blood cells. So there is you know, less oxygen carried to the heart. It increases the risk of heart disease by damaging the artery wall and allowing more cholesterol to deposit on the wall. Smoking reduces the HDL. Remember I told you earlier, we want that HDL to be high, but smoking lowers it. And it makes, it makes blood thicker and easier to form clots. So what can you do? Stop smoking one day at a time. Plan other activities to help avoid smoking like, activities, chewing gum, or another hobby, you know, ask a friend to help you quit. Um, you know, just kind of determine what triggers you have. Also talk about your goals with your doctor. There are some programs that are available um, and there are some medication assistance options too. So talk to your doctor about that. Support groups are out there too. There's so many options that can really be helpful for you. You know, hypertension is a risk factor. Blood pressure is the amount of force on the artery wall when your heart pumps and relaxes with each heartbeat. So if you guys want to know what that, what that goal is, 120 over 80, we want it to be normal, 120 over 80. But when you've got the narrowing of those blood vessels, it increases the pressure causing the heart to have to work harder. So prevent hypertension by taking medications as prescribed, losing weight, stop smoking, lower the sodium in your diet, um, get regular visits with your, with your primary care doctor, physical activity, which is what this is all about today, limiting your alcohol and ma making sure that your cholesterol is under good control as well. And cholesterol here, it's a fatty like, you know, fatty wax like substance in the blood. You know, the HDL are good because they carry that extra fat away from the arteries and the LDL, LDL are bad because they cause fat buildup on the artery wall. So you should check your cholesterol once a year. And if it is high and you're trying to make changes, you can lower your fat intake by 30%. Try to work on what areas of your diet might you be able to change to lower the fat content, reduce your saturated fat. A lot of those you know, convenience items, fast foods are going to be higher in saturated fat. Also keeping your cholesterol, the dietary cholesterol, less than 300 milligrams. Um, lastly here, we got impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose. It increases our risk for cardiovascular disease. Obesity increases risk by increasing bad cholesterol and triglyceride levels. So this is decreasing good cholesterol and making your heart work harder. So you can reduce your total calories, start exercising, and work with your doctor, the dietitian, your Cecilia Health educator, and just make a plan that's right for you. Not everybody is going to have the same plan either. So lastly, a sedentary lifestyle. It increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. Exercise, as we've noted earlier, it strengthens the heart muscle, tones muscles, it aids in your weight reduction, lowers cholesterol, improves blood pressure, your pulse rate, and not exercising, you won't get any of those benefits. So it's very, very important. So for those of you seeing your screen right now, we got a cartoon that says, what fits your busy schedule better? Ex exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? And I had a 
a, a lady say, oh, that was a heavy cartoon, might, might I say. And that's right. But you know what? So many times I, I talk about, you know, in your day, are, are there times when you're scrolling on your phone, that you're watching television, that you're, you're, what, you're going through commercials? There's probably easily 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes you can think like, can I integrate activity somehow? Was there a moment when I really could have done something? So yes, can we fit it in our schedule? We would definitely rather fit it in your schedule than not getting to live long, a longer, healthier life, satisfying life. So the golden key. So there are some conditions that would warrant being, you know, being activity, you gotta maybe proceed with caution. There are some circumstances where you have to be careful. So of course, always, and when I have patients have any issues that say, you know, I can't really, Laura Ashley, it's, I, you know, I really feel like it brings me more pain than pleasure, then I, we kind of probe what is it that's hurting you and try to see what we can do to, to go around it. But I always say, talk to your doctor first. Sometimes conditions may warrant you to see a physical therapist or an occupational therapist to give you the types of exercises that aren't going to damage whatever's bothering you further. So we definitely don't want you to push through it unless we know it's safe. So conditions like arthritis, osteoarthritis, back pain, neuropathy. So especially diabetic neuropathy, if you've got some, you know, things going on with your feet re related to your diabetes management, we definitely want to address that. Charcot's foot and um, retinopathy, those are, those are just a few though. Um, I definitely know that the neuropathy is one, when I've got patients telling me that they've got um, very painful feet, um, ingrown toenails that are infected or a nail that's discolored, especially, um, if they've got some red reddish areas on their feet, we, we really don't want you to be out there walking in those shoes, not addressing maybe what's causing that to happen. So just like your Cecilia House coach tells you, a minimum of once a year is your annual foot check. We always ask our patients, when was the last time you had your monofilament test? That's the little pin pr you know, prick around your toe, your toes and your feet, seeing if you've had any sensation changes. Because you know, ensuring your feet are healthy and prepared to take on a healthy, new, safe exercise is vital. The last thing we want to do is have you walking along and creating a blister that can, through a cascade of other problems, be difficult to heal. I'll tell you a quick story here that I had a patient a couple years ago here with Cecilia Health. He kept denying me going getting his feet checked. I told him, you know, it's important once a year you get this checked because we gauge it year to year if there's any changes or if we need to address anything. Well, then a year after I'd been working with him, he went out on with some boat shoes, those like Sperry types of shoes. And he created a very big blister right below his toes. So right at that like pad of his foot. And he didn't realize he didn't have feeling there. And he had to be on IV antibiotics for a few months to help heal that wound. And he said, I wish I'd listened to you. I wish I'd listened to you. Because he definitely wouldn't have been wearing those shoes and he would have been checking his feet, especially in those areas every day. So that's just a fair warning. Even if someone says, ah, I got my feet are fine, my feet are fine. I say, get them checked still, just to double check, just to double check. All right, we've got some take home messages here. So not exercising is being like being sedentary is just like smoking. All of those negative things we talked about with how smoking can increase your cardiovascular disease and increase your risk of having, you know, hypertension, high cholesterol, um, poor blood sugar management. It's, it's just like smoking, not exercising and letting your heart pump and work harder and burn that sugar. It's, it's, it's in its own self a really negative thing for your body. So if you don't, if you do not exercise, you're at the same risk as a smoker. And I think that's a pretty, last time when I did this um, webinar, a lady th thought that that was shocking. Like she thought, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, but I never, you know, I don't get up and move. So 
let's talk what's the prescription we got to start moving more and start some type of exercise program today today's a new day it doesn't matter if for the last year you haven't done a thing today is a new day and today you can start you can absolutely start today so there is a difference between what exercise is and physical activity so if i've got someone that says yeah i exercise you know I, I, at work i'm pretty busy most of the day well that you know there are certain jobs that will that really really are i would say exercise because they are moving non-stop all day but physical activity is movement that is carried out by the skeletal muscles that requires energy in other words any movement that we do is physical activity so me right now talking away with all my friends here on the webinar is physical activity i'm moving my body i'm moving my hands you can't see me but i am moving but exercise is planned it's structured it's repetitive and it's intentional movement intended to improve or maintain physical fitness so you see that there is there is a difference between the two so physical activity you might say like this gentleman on the on the powerpoint is growing some plants doing some gardening and you see some exercise over on the other side they're doing in like you know planned structured movement with looks like yoga um in the gym some stretching as well so there's a difference between the two. Oops, one, one, one. All right, so here is another study. So just, you know, the American College of Sports Medicine, we go by their guidelines. This is their recommendations. And this is the answer to one of the questions I've already gotten here. And we want to make sure you knew. What is the recommendation for how much you should get to? And that's 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular per week. So you could do it in two different ways. You could do it 30 minutes to an hour of moderate intense activity five days a week, or you could do 20 to 60 minutes of vigorous intensity. So something that's you know a lot more strenuous, you could do that three days a week. Now you can certainly do shorter intervals too. I often get the question of, is there a better time of day I should be doing it? I always tell patients whenever you can get it in. That is the like getting it in is the most important aspect to me. If you feel better and you're motivated in the morning, do it in the morning. If you feel like at night when you exercise, it revs you up too much and then you have a hard time sleeping, don't exercise at night. Maybe do it in the middle of the day. So you can break break it up, certainly do that. So adults should also do some resistance exercises a couple of days a week. So resistance, we want to put some weight on it too. We, you know, we talked about how physical activity can help with your muscles and your bone density, especially for ladies. Our, as we get get older, our bones can lose that density, and we don't want to be breaking our hip and our and our knees, or you know, hurting ourselves and losing that really good bone strength. So. Very light or resistance is best for previously sedentary or older adults. So you're not gonna be picking up a 20 pound dumbbell. Or, you know, that's probably a little too heavy, but if you even held a water bottle in your hands as you go walking, that's a little bit of resistance. Maybe you kind of pump your arms up and down as you're doing it too. So that's a good light activity. For power, it's eight to 12 reps, 10 to 15 reps for strength, 15 to 20 for endurance and two to four sets for strength and power. Now for me, I would say I need a trainer or something to kind of help guide me in these types of reps that would be good for my, uh, my health. And I would recommend that for anybody else. If you're kind of new at resistance exercises and well, what does she mean by reps and what does she mean by sets? You, a lot of the gyms and as they're opening, this is a blessing now that things are starting to open back up. Um, they often will offer a like a one time tr with a trainer um, as an option for you. And if that's something they offer for free or maybe you pay for for once, they could at least guide you in the right direction of these are the exercises I should do as a routine. These are the amount of weights I should do for this particular part of my body. Um, so I say ask for guidance because those trainers out there, they love to tell you how to do a good job and how to, they can help you improve your your health as well 
So here is an, another element here. So we're going to try to get this exercise in because we're improving our health and blood glucose and we're wanting to lose weight. So what are we looking for to do this for? You can divide the time 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon. There's 20 minutes a day. So five times a week, we want 20 to 30 minutes to help improve our blood glucose. Five to seven times per week, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to help lose weight. Not everybody with diabetes needs weight loss as well. It might not be one of your goals. Maybe it really is just getting your blood sugars under good control. So kind of figure out which one is best for you. Are you just more of the five times per week because you're trying to get your, you know, your heart pumping, work on your heart health and your sugars, or do you need to increase it a little bit so that you can try to lose some weight? And that will also help with blood sugars and your heart health too. So managing blood glucose. So now overall, we want exercise to lower blood glucose, but be aware unplanned activity or activity without possible medication adjustment or food adjustment could lead to low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. So too low is not too good, okay? So there are two main reasons exercise could cause low blood glucose. Too much insulin in the bloodstream and not enough carbohydrates to meet the needs of your body during the activity. And also depending on the intensity or even the length of your activity, you may need additional fuel from carbohydrates during your activity. I like to tell my patients, and I actually just told my niece this today, she said she went and did a boot camp this morning and barely made it through it. And I said, well, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? She goes, well, I didn't eat breakfast. I just went as soon as I got up from bed. Well, I said, that's why you weren't able to complete it with enough strength because you didn't fill your tank before you used your gas. You got to fill your tank first. So your body may need additional carbs like yogurt, fruit, crackers to, to rebuild the glucose stores that are in your liver and your muscles. And we'll talk more about carbohydrates in a few minutes. So, you know, it, it's a balancing act between your medications, your exercise and the amount of stored carbohydrates or carbohydrates that you eat. So it's important to note that the risk of low blood glucose primarily applies to those taking insulin or certain oral med medications that cause the pancreas to, to make more insulin, such as sulfonylureas, and those are like glipizide, gliburide, glimepiride. So if you are unsure, you know, how your medication works, then talk to your healthcare provider or your Cecilia Health Diabetes Educator. We can help you understand if it's a medication that we need to be, you know, cautioning you with before your exercise. So remember too, when you lose weight, you are more sensitive to medication and a low blood glucose could result. So, so how do you know if you're having a low blood glucose? Well, a low blood glucose is less than 70, so you may feel shaky, dizzy, nervous, kind of hungry, even clumsy. So it's very important that you test your blood glucose whenever you feel these symptoms. You don't want to guess how low your blood glucose is. We don't want to be guessing. Okay. So if you're having low blood glucose episodes, this is important to, it's really important, an important time to schedule an appointment so they can help you troubleshoot your low blood glucose. We don't want these happening all the time. So less than 70, that's our warning. Um, sometimes the symptoms will come a little bit early too. Okay. All right. So treating it. What can you do about it then? Okay. So if you do experience low blood glucose, here's what to do. Remember that a low blood gl glucose is less than 70 unless you've been given a different low blood glucose. I've, some, I've had a patient this, today said that hers is 80, but the standard is 70. She just gets really sensitive when she's in the 90s. So lower than 70 is low. So immediately eat 15 grams of carbs, and that can come in many forms. You could do it in glucose tablets. You could do it in fruit juice, a half a cup. Um, you could do it in dried fruit, so like two tablespoons of raisins. Um, all of these could work, but what you do is have 15 grams. Another one, I'll tell you another favorite of my kiddos that I have with type 1 diabetes. They keep little baggies of jelly belly beans because they're one gram per bean. So we tell them, you know, put 15 beans in a bag. And then if you have a low, eat your jelly beans and then proceed. So after you've had your 15 grams of carbohydrates, you wait 15 minutes and then you check your blood sugar again. 
And if it is still less than 70, then repeat yourself again and have 15 grams of carbs and recheck again in 15 minutes. So you just keep doing this, eat 15 or drink 15 and recheck in 15. And that's called the rule of 15. Okay, so that's, and yes, I had a question here of, are there other things you can do besides these tablets, fruit juice and raisins? Absolutely. Um, you wanna make sure it only is carbohydrates though. So to tell me, I, I just ate a couple peanut butter and crackers. Th that's not what we wanna do when it is already too low. If it's below 70, you want it to be only carbs. And peanut butter and crackers has fat in it and protein too. We don't wanna be having to to work on other things. We want just, just straight carbs so we can get that sugar going up. We don't wanna be working on protein and fat too. You could also do candies like Starburst, Skittles, the little sweet tarts. I have some patients that do the little honey packets. They carry the little honey packets and they just squeeze it in their mouth. Um, icing, the little tubes of icing, those are often a source as well. So that's a good question. There's, yeah, there's lots of things. We just want to make sure it's only carbs. We don't want to be treating it with like peanut butter and crackers or even, even milk. Milk is one that I have patients tell me they'll have, but milk has protein and fat in there too. So we'd, we'd rather have juice or regular pop, something that's only carbs. Good, good question. Okay, so reduce your chance of low blood glucose before and during exercise. So check your, you know, a low blood glucose can be frustrating, especially when you're exercising, you're trying to do something good for your body and you're like, Ugh, now I'm having to deal with this. So, you know, we want to try and help you plan ahead to prevent the low blood glucose from happening. One way to start is to make sure you're, you keep a detailed record of your blood glucose before and after you exercise. So, you know, this is important if you are on insulin and pills too, because then you can kind of see a trend of, okay, if I'm running between 100 and 150, then I'm going to eat this type of snack. If I'm between 150 and 250, like you might have some um, parameters where you know that I need this kind of snack if I'm starting out my exercise with this type of blood sugar. You know, so if you test your blood sugar and it is less than 100, make sure you have a snack. That you know, you want to make sure it's at least 15 grams of carbs as well. So here's some great examples here too. I have a, some crackers, a small piece of fresh fruit, some yogurt. It's also good along with the carbs to have a little bit of protein. So there are some bars that you can get that are a little bit, um, they have less than 15 grams or about 15 grams and a little bit of protein as well. So that's good, a Greek yogurt. Um, this might be a good place for peanut butter and crackers because you're not treating it low, you're okay. You're just prepping yourself. You're filling your tank so you can use your fuel. So also for low blood glucose during exercise, you should try 15 to 30 grams of carbs consumed about every 30 to 60 minutes of exercise as a guide. So people who like exercise a really long time, you, you might have to have some snacks, you know, along the way to make sure you stay stable. Sometimes it can be difficult to kind of manage, but uh, the, the more you do it and the more you check your blood sugars and really rely on what are your symptoms, if you're feeling okay, it gets easier over time and a little bit better to manage because you're, you're seeing your own trend of what's going on. So what is a low blood glucose post-exercise? So check your pre and post. Before exercise, 110 to 140 um, is insulin and above 90 if you're pills. So you wanna make sure you're above those, those scales depending on what you're taking. So oral agents higher than 90, insulin, this is for after your exercise. You wanna make sure you're above 110 if you're on insulin and if you're a child, after the exercise, you, whoop, you wanna make sure it is more than 120 to 130, okay? I'm gonna show that one more time because someone asked me, they wanted to make sure they get this right. So before exercise, 110 to 140, make sure it is above that if you're on insulin. If you're only on pills, make sure you start your exercise, you're gonna be above 90. And then after exercise, make sure you're above 90 with oral medications. Insulin, make sure you're above 110. Children, 120 to 130.
Okay. So managing blood glucose. So to reduce your chance of low blood glucose after exercise, remember that blood glucose can be lowered many hours after you exercise. For this reason, it's a good idea to have carbohydrates and your meter nearby. Um, higher in intensity activities can lower your blood glucose faster and for longer. So how long you are active also needs to be considered. You know, as we mentioned before, monitoring your blood glucose before and after activity will help you learn the effects of activity on your blood glucose control. And it's important because every person's response to activity is different. It really is. And you may want to also monitor your blood glucose before going to bed. Like we said earlier, you're going to have maybe this lag effect. So if you exercise four or five o'clock, you could eight, nine o'clock still be in this you know, increased lowering effect of your blood sugars. So always check after exercise and it's not a bad idea to check before bed too. Here we have another cartoon. I was hoping you'd let me know how much more insulin I need to take if I decide to supersize my order. So here, here's the thing. You can't train away a bad diet. You, you can't exercise away a bad diet. So if you're exercising, but you just eat really poorly, you know, you're kind of just defeating all this effort and what you're putting, you know, you're putting in so much work to try to help yourself, but then you're really still harming yourself. So, you know, just remember 3,500 calories equals one pound. So you may, you need to create a deficit of some calories over the course of maybe a week so that you can lose some. I always tell patients, especially now with social media, how it is, I see people telling patients they need to eat a thousand calories a day or less than a thousand or less than 1200. And that's not a good idea either. You can't starve your body either. So you might want to talk with your dietitian about what are your calorie needs and maybe what calories should you shoot for in order to lose weight. And like we mentioned earlier with exercise, it's different for everyone and calorie needs are different for everyone. I wish I could tell you, yes, if everybody here had 1700 calories, you're going to lose a couple pounds a week, but that's not even the case. You have to know what it is your body needs and what it might need to create as a deficit to lose some weight. So diet is the weight loser. Physical activity is the weight maintainer. And just think, as you're losing weight too, you're going to be able to improve the ability to exercise and how you feel as well. Here we have another chart. This is the effect of diet plus and negative on exercise and weight loss. So let's watch here. So the perforated line is no exercise. So we do have some weight loss, but that, that's just with that alone. And now let's look at it with exercise. So diet and exercise, double doing it definitely going to show a better effect and I like that this is a male policeman population this is what this came from <laughs> but now let's look over the course of time okay because what we want to do is also create sustainable changes as well so here's here's incorporating exercise kind of stagnant but and then there's some that increase their exercise and they're also improving their with no diet but look here what happens over time I'm going to kind of move it forward. All right. So as you can see, when you've got diet and exercise going together, then that's when you're going to see the best results over the course of 18 months. Okay. So some of us may need to adjust insulin if you're on it. Um, generally, these are these are just recommendations. I think as Katie mentioned earlier too, you definitely need to ask your doctor what would be best for you. But these are some general guidelines. So if you're on a Hemolog, regular or Novolog type of fast acting insulin, you would cut it in half, like two to one. Um, the MPH 7030, the, the middle acting kind, that would be cut in half as well, like four units to two units. And Really, the Lantus and Levomir, those are the long-acting ones. They're going to be working across the whole day, so they may not be adjusted at all. It's usually the fast-acting ones that are needing to be adjusted, but talk to your doctor on what you should do for sure. We talked about snacking already, but 30 minutes, um, 15 to 30 grams of carbs, 
if you're going to, that's, if you're going to work out for 30 minutes, that's the carbs that you would want for a good snack beforehand. If you're going to do an hour of activity, have the same amount of carbs, but incorporate some protein as well, seven to eight grams of protein. If you're going to work out for more than an hour, have the same amount of carbs, you're going to have some protein as well, and also you digest your, your insulin if you're on insulin. So what should I do? Insulin planning activity is, is a good idea um, to lose or maintain weight and to improve control. You definitely want to try to create some good um, expectations of what your blood sugars do, keep track of your blood sugars, either on like a continuous glucose monitor or finger sticks that you may check so that you can know how to adjust your medications. One thing with insulin, we don't want you to be going low all the time and then having to treat yourself all the time as well, because it's also making you eat more and you're trying to lose weight. And you're, it's like this, like, what can I do? Talk to your doctor because they may need to make some adjustments with your medicine. OK, and when to have snacks, especially if you're doing long duration activities or unplanned activities. Um, when should I not exercise? In general, sick days, if you got some respiratory issues, head colds, if your blood sugar is over 250, you might want to check for ketones. If you don't know what ketones are, um, ask your doctor if that's something you need to be checking. But specifically, <coughs> If you've got type 2 diabetes, you don't want to exercise if you're over 400. Type 1 if you're over 300. And check your blood sugars within 5 to 10 minutes. It should be dropping, but otherwise stop. And type 1, always check for ketones when blood sugars are over 250. If you have ketones, then stop. So managing blood sugars, what can you do? Kind of have yourself a go-to kit so you're prepared. Have your meter something on you that shows that you have diabetes like a, a bracelet or a necklace or something to show people in the gym or in the place you're working out maybe even if you're taking a walk it's good to have something that can show you've got diabetes you could carry a carbohydrate source with you one of our snacks we talked about some of our uh, low blood sugar treatments you could carry with you definitely carry your phone so you can reach out to someone if you need assistance Staying hydrated is really important so that you aren't, you know, dehy dehydration is not an issue for you. And of course, making sure that you're wearing good shoes that aren't rubbing on your feet. So I'll, if you're not sure if it's rubbing on your feet, do some good foot checks at the end of your activities and maybe a family member or friend could help you just to make sure there's no red areas. We've talked about goal setting on other webinars too, but this is just like a quick review. But you want to set a goal. You want to be smart with it. And those stand for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So an example of this will I will will be I will walk five days every week for 30 minutes each week. So maybe you're like, well, goodness, that is a big goal. Well, that might not be the goal for you. Your your goal to start might be I will walk Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 10 minutes this week and next week I'm going to walk Monday, Wednesday, Friday for 15 minutes and leave it at that. You're specific on the amount of days, you know how long you're going to do it, how many days you're going to do it. You set it at an attainable start, something that's it's, it's going to be something you can do. It's relevant. You're you're setting something that's going to help with your blood sugars and your heart health and your weight loss and you've put a parameter on it. You want to do it this week and then next week you're going to change it. So be smart and set goals that are right for you. Here's a picture of a gym. Gyms aren't the only place that you can exercise though, right? You can exercise in your home. My best example I give patients is if you're watching TV at every commercial break, get up and walk in your house. If you're watching an hour long show, you're going to get at least 15, 20 minutes in just doing that. So that's a, a good one right there. Walk to your mailbox, make some laps in a mall or in a store. Lots of ways to get that. The elevator to success is out of order. You'll have to use the stairs one step at a time. Remember, it's one day at a time. Today's a new day. You can start today just by getting out there and walking to your mailbox for 10 minutes, getting out there. Today can be your start. All right. So I'll wait here just a moment and see if we got some questions that come in. All right. 
do I need to cut out my carbs? No, we, we don't want to do that. So as your, your dietitian or diabetes educator works with you with Cecilia Health, um, we don't want you cutting out all your carbs, especially if you're on medications that warrant helping you know, your blood sugars come down. So we don't, we don't want you to be doing that. Ask your dietitian or your Cecilia coach about how much you should be having with meals, but definitely reference the snacks I mentioned earlier with having a snack before your activity, maybe around 15 to 30 grams that can help you Oh, how long before exercise should you have the 15 gram snack? About 15 to 30 minutes before your activity is a good idea to have before your activity. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Because then it's going to be on the rise. Usually around 15 minutes is good. If you do it right when you're about to exercise, sometimes it can make your tummy a little upset too. So you don't want to work out on a full snack belly too. So maybe around 15 to 30 minutes before the activity. Great question. Why does my diabetes make me tired all the time? So it could be a lot of things affecting you. You know, maybe it's your medications you're on. It could impact you. If you're not active right now, not having activity into your regular routine can make you tired too, which makes it hard to get it started sometimes. But if you could just push yourself to do five to 10 minutes, you know, it might be hard at first, but you're going to build your stamina and your energy level over time. So just, um, ex you could be tired too. You might wanna check your blood sugar, make sure you're not low. That can make you feel tired. Or if you're eating too many carbs, that can make you feel sluggish. So maybe look at your diet, see if that might be something um, impacting you. Is juice better than soda pop for my blood sugar? <coughs> In general, we all we say be careful with juice and pop um, because both of them are concentrated with carbohydrates, but they're both great for treating low blood sugars. So either one would be fine. They're both straight carbs. You know, we are um, just trying to get your blood sugar to come up. So if you have about a half a cup of juice and pop it, some of them are a little bit different, but usually a half a cup to a three quarter cup of pop will be about 15 grams of carbs. Okay. All right, we'll give it another moment. Is an apple a good snack for diabetes before an, a workout? Absolutely, an apple would be great. That's a great idea. You know, it, fruit is good. Sometimes with fruit, it can kind of make your blood sugar go up quickly and come back down quickly. So if that's the way that your blood sugar is impacted by um, fruit, just maybe have some protein with it. So maybe have a piece of fruit with some um, with some cheese or with some deli meat or some jerky, and that might be a better combination. And remember a banana, that's the next question, is banana good? A banana, it's good for muscles for sure, but it's 28 grams of carbs for an average banana. So just scale it back to maybe half a banana. And then after your workout, maybe have the other half of your banana. All right, where to begin? Oh, just begin today. Go, you know, tonight in your favorite show, Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, whatever you're watching, maybe stand up. You know, think about too, you've got chair exercises you can do. You can get exercise bands. You can walk with a friend, listen to podcasts. My biggest tip for my patients usually is make exercise entertaining and fun. If you don't, then you won't be as inclined to want to do it. So make it fun. Make it fun. I like watching a show sometimes, like something like a series on the, it's a treadmill. I'll watch a show that has lots of episodes and then I look forward to getting on the treadmill so I can see what happens in the next episode. Okay, you guys had awesome questions tonight. This has been so good. I've enjoyed, this is one of my favorite webinars. So upcoming events, the next one is June the 9th. It's Mythbusters, Separating Fact from Fiction, Finally Diabetes Unveiled. And then um, the next one after that is July the 12th. So your certified diabetes educator will, um, care and education specialist will send you the live webinar event. And if you want to go back and listen to this one or any of the ones from the past, they're on your link. You can always click on it and watch them. They're recorded. And this one usually takes a couple days, I believe, to load it to the website, but they'll put it on there. So you can visit us 
text us. We're on Facebook as well. And thank you for joining us. I appreciate your attendance and your participation, all the great questions. I know that with this attendance, you guys are, are motivated. Get out there tonight and take that first step. It's your first step to feeling good. Thanks.